Good evening and welcome to the Gospel Truth. I'm Brother Alan Jackson, bringing to you spiritual songs and hymns and the power of the spoken word of God. First of all, giving thanks to God Almighty for blessing me with this, another opportunity to yet be on this the time side of life and have this another blessed privilege to come to you in his name by way of this television medium and to bring to you another message from his holy and divine word. And as I always do, I'd like to continue to express my appreciation to the production staff for their service to the gospel truth. And I'm praying that God will continue to bless them with those things that he knows that they're standing in need of. And I'm praying on your behalf as observers of the program. And I'm praying that God will continue to bless you and your family members with those things that he knows that you're standing in need of as well. And then, of course, I'm encouraging you to pray on my behalf because I'm also standing in need of prayer, and it's only God who can provide me with those things that I'm standing in need of. And again, we'd like to uh, welcome you to the uh, Black American History Tribute. This is February, and uh, we do this uh, every year in an effort to uh, reflect on uh, some of the advances that we've made and from places that we have come and to where we are yet to go. Uh, it's February, of course, this is African American History Month. And once again, the uh, Gospel Truth uh, will pay tribute to black American history. This year, 2017, with the changing of the White House Guard uh, and the rhetoric of Make America Great Again, I believe that it is necessary for us as people to reflect back over our history in an effort to reignite our quest for justice and equality. It has been said that if you don't know your history, you are bound to repeat it. This will be the last week of America in the 20th century, the Civil Rights Movement. And last week, there was a little glitch about five minutes before the end of the program. I encourage you to go to YouTube if you have access to that. Uh, and then what you can do is you can bring up on YouTube America, the 20th, 20th century, and the Civil Rights Movement. And then you can take in the program in its entirety, you and your family, without any interruptions. And you all can see exactly uh, what we had to endure to get to where we are today. Hopefully, uh, it will stimulate your motivation and enable you to get busy working and organizing efforts to make us, as God's people, greater than before. So please, again, bring your children into wherever you are and let them be able to observe the program and see what it took for us, as black people, to get to where we are today. Uh, in view of our current administration, we must be vigilant, we must be prepared, and we must be ready. So again, this evening, the final aspect or part three of America in the 20th century, the Civil Rights Movement. Twelve hundred blacks were added to Mississippi's voter rolls during Freedom Summer. At a brutal cost of 35 shootings, 30 bombings, 80 physical attacks, and six murders. 15,000 other Negro applicants petitioned the registrar, but were rejected. But the summer project was far from a failure. It helped to launch the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which challenged the legitimacy of the all-white Democratic Party in the state. And it successfully focused national attention on the need for voting rights legislation, a cause that was destined to galvanize the movement and the entire nation in Selma, Alabama, six months later. When Lyndon Johnson assumed the presidency in 1963, Movement leaders feared they would lose the meager gains achieved under President Kennedy. But the new president, a native southerner, embraced the cause of civil rights as a great domestic challenge and a historic opportunity. This bill is going to pass if it takes us all summer. 
And this bill is going to be signed and enacted into law because justice and morality demand it. President Johnson applied his passion and political acumen to the cause. He encouraged congressmen, cajoled the press, and enjoined the public to support new civil rights legislation. The civil rights bill now before Congress is a far-reaching step in the direction of equality. Legislators who resisted were subjected to the full force of the president's overbearing personality, the Johnson treatment. Johnson once said the only power he had was the power to persuade, to which an aide replied, that was like saying the only wind we have is a hurricane. Within a year, Johnson achieved his goal. Congress passes the most sweeping civil rights bill ever to be written into the law, and thus reaffirms the conception of equality for all men that began with Lincoln and the Civil War 100 years ago. I am about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We believe that all men are entitled to the blessings of liberty, yet millions are being deprived of those blessings not because of their own failures, but because of the color of their skin. But it cannot continue. Our Constitution, foundation of our Republic, forbids it. The principles of our freedom forbid it. Morality forbids it. And the law I will sign tonight forbids it. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the most sweeping civil rights legislation since Reconstruction. It outlawed discrimination on the basis of race, religion, national origin, or gender, and banned the practice of segregation in schools, public places, and employment. It was a major advancement toward racial equality, but it did not provide total equality. In many areas, literacy tests and other forms of discrimination still prevented African Americans from voting. Right here, you're in prison. In other words, you tell what it means. And it's right here, meaning your understanding of it. To the president's chagrin, demonstrations continued. In 1965, protests targeted Selma, Alabama, the seat of Dallas County, where fewer than 1% of eligible blacks were registered to vote and where bully boy segregationist Sheriff Jim Clark and his deputized citizens posse rounded up civil rights activists using Gestapo tactics and cattle prods. Snake's John Lewis was among more than 2,000 demonstrators jailed in the first months of 1965. If we're wrong, why don't you arrest us? Why don't you get out The Reverend C.T. Vivian. An organizer for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference led the Selma campaign. We're willing to be beaten for democracy, and you misuse democracy in the street. You beat people bloody in order that they will not have the privilege to vote. You beat me in the side and then hide your blows. But go on. No, I don't we need to leave. We have come to register to vote. And you must realize that this is a national issue. It's not a Selma issue. It's not an Alabama issue. This is a national issue. Whenever anyone does not have the right to vote, then every man is hurt. I don't want need to leave. To On the night of February 18th, state troopers savagely attacked Vivian and other demonstrators. In the chaos, a young man named Jimmy Lee Jackson was shot at point-blank range in what the local newspaper called a nightmare of state police stupidity. He was murdered by the irresponsibility of every politician from governors on down who has fed his constituents a stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. The tragedy galvanized the Selma voting rights campaign. 
The SCLC's James Bevel proposed a symbolic march from Selma to the Alabama State Capitol in Montgomery, more than 50 miles away. On March 7, 1965, SNCC's John Lewis and the SCLC's Hosea Williams led a procession of more than 500 marchers over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Alabama State Troopers, clad in gas masks and riot gear, waited on the other side. It'll be detrimental to your safety to continue this march, and I'm saying that this is an unlawful assembly. You are ordered to disperse, go home, or go to your church. This march will not continue. News cameras immortalized a hellish scene of police brutality and chaos. Images of Bloody Sunday shocked the nation. Time magazine reported that rarely in human history has public opinion reacted so spontaneously and with such fury. We have no alternative but to keep moving with determination. We've gone too far now to turn back. Two weeks later, Martin Luther King led more than 3,000 demonstrators in a repeat of the Bloody Sunday March. This time, there would be no tear gas, no bull whips, no billy clubs. At times, history and fate meet at a single time, in a single place, to shape a turning point in man's unending search for freedom. So it was at Lexington and Concord. So it was a century ago at Appomattox. So it was last week in Selma, Alabama. On March 15, 1965, President Johnson called upon Congress to enact new voting rights legislation. Our mission is at once the oldest and the most basic of this country, to right wrong, to do justice, to serve man. The issue of equal rights for American Negroes is such an issue. And should we defeat every enemy, and should we double our wealth and conquer the stars, and still be unequal to this issue, then we will have failed as a people and as a nation. For with a country as with a person, what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? When the Selma to Montgomery march reached its destination five days later, its numbers surpassed 25,000. Ten years after the Montgomery bus boycott christened the civil rights movement, the crusade was at its zenith, unified, triumphant, and nonviolent. I know you're asking today, how long will it take? How long? Not long. But even as Martin Luther King reassured the faithful that their goal was within reach, divisions between the old guard and young militants within SNCC threatened to splinter the movement itself. In the same room where President Lincoln signed the first emancipation order in 1861, President Johnson signed the 1965 Voter Registration Act and pledged to millions of Americans a new chance to find a political voice. On August 6th, 1965, just five months after the violence of Selma and the president's civil rights appeal to Congress, Lyndon Johnson signed into law the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Five days later, the Watts District of Los Angeles erupted in the worst race riots in the city's history. National attention was riveted on the streets of L.A. But the riots there were simply manifestations of the racial tension and rage that simmered in every major U.S. city during the period. You get too much 
to ask you to grant us human dignity. Should we be put there and stop to death for this request? If so, you can aim your gun. What the hell do you think we care about dying if you're going to deny us the right to live? Poverty, unemployment, police harassment, unfulfilled expectations had created a tinderbox on the streets of inner city ghettos. The civil rights movement had dismantled the southern system of segregation and white supremacy, but it had largely ignored the insidious racism that festered elsewhere. Northern blacks were angry, disaffected, and easily seduced by fringe groups. They call Mr. Muhammad a hate teacher because he makes your hate dope and alcohol. Malcolm X had emerged in the early 1960s as a radical alternative to Martin Luther King and nonviolence, which he called the philosophy of the fool. Condemning the racist practices. As the chief spokesman for a black nationalist group called the Nation of Islam, Malcolm X espoused self-reliance and separatism rather than integration. To his admirers, he was a courageous advocate for black rights. But for many others, he symbolized reverse racism, black supremacy, and violence. In a vicious cycle of poverty, of ignorance, of apathy, of disease, and of death. And they have these old Uncle Tom Negro leaders coming to Harlem, telling you and me that times are getting better. Your times will never get better until you make them better. During his lifetime, Malcolm X did not achieve the notoriety of figures like King, but he was assassinated in 1965 and in death became a near mythic figure. His revolutionary rhetoric infected many civil rights veterans, especially within the core of SNCC. You go sit in front of your television set and listen to LBJ tell you that violence never accomplishes anything, my fellow Americans. But you see, the real problem with violence is that we have never been violent. We have been too nonviolent. Under the new leadership of Stokely Carmichael, SNCC assumed a militant posture beginning in 1966. The group's mantra of nonviolence was replaced by the chorus of black power. For Americans who were just beginning to warm to the idea of civil rights, black power was something altogether different. Martin Luther King considered the slogan, at best, an unfortunate choice of words. Roy Wilkins of the NAACP called it the father of hatred and the mother of violence. John Lewis feared that black power would divide the races and the movement. And it did. The new movement challenged the established relationship between whites and blacks. In some communities, black power was exercised in the voting booth. In 1967, Cleveland voters elected Carl Stokes as mayor. He was the first Negro to hold the position of chief executive of a major U.S. city. But in other parts of the country, black power meant bullets, not ballots. In Oakland, California, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale formed the Black Panther Party. What began as a community organization to provide free breakfasts and liberation schools to ghetto kids ultimately devolved into murder, rape, bank heists, and drug trafficking. The anarchy was not limited to California. Chicago, Newark, Minneapolis, Memphis. In scores of American cities, blacks rebelled against chronic racism and police brutality during the late 1960s. In turn, white America took up arms. Civil rights had become civil war. President Johnson's great society, a lawless society. By nearly any measure, the United States was immensely divided in the late 60s. Divided on civil rights, by the war in Vietnam, 
and by a generation gap without equal in American history. Black Power brought an end to the civil rights movement that began with the Montgomery bus boycott in 1956, but it never achieved mainstream recognition. The majority of Negroes, or blacks, as many now prefer to be called, still look to figures such as Martin Luther King for leadership. In April 1968, Martin Luther King traveled to Memphis, Tennessee to speak in support of striking sanitation workers. The message of hope was familiar, but with an ominous sense of foreboding. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. One day later, King stepped from his room at the Lorraine Motel and was gunned down by an assassin. From coast to coast, America erupted in violence. Edward Kozner of Newsweek recalled, It was a Pandora's box flung open, an apocalyptic act that loosed the furies brooding in America's sullen ghettos. Once again, the heart of America is heavy for a tragedy that denies the very meaning of our land. The life of a man who symbolized the freedom and faith of America has been taken. The dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. has not died with him. Men who are white, men who are black, must and will now join together as never in the past to let all the forces of divisiveness know that America shall not be ruled by the bullet but only by the ballot of free and of just men. The Civil Rights Movement could rightfully claim victory in desegregating the South and opening its voting rolls to millions of blacks who had been disenfranchised for a century. But the rioting demonstrated that deep problems remain. We need to know the answer, I think, to three basic questions about these riots. What happened? Why did it happen? What can be done to prevent it from happening again and again? President Johnson appointed a special committee to study the violence and race riots of the late 1960s. The Kerner Commission concluded that America was moving toward two separate societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. It warned that frustration and resentment resulting from brutalizing inequality and white racism were fostering violence by blacks. As the 1970s dawned, African Americans were no longer at the back of the bus. But the challenge of achieving true freedom and equality remained. It would be left for the next generation and those who followed to finish, once and for all, what President Lincoln had started. Well, now, as we consider the experiences that we have all had as American citizens within the first hundred days of our new president, Lord knows we have seen some things, all right? And uh, I guess now some of us may not have faith in our local news because uh, we're always being told now that that's fake news, so you don't know what to believe. It appears to me that somebody is trying to develop a fear, a mass hysteria, uh, regarding the threat of terrorism, but 
I'm sure that as you observed the program that I presented, that you saw what terrorism was in America. And we know who the terrorists are. And so what we need to do is just keep in mind that uh, there was a saying, I heard a preacher say, he said, if, if we ever needed the Lord, then we sure do need him now. So, of course, I'm encouraging all of you to draw close to the Lord. And so James said, draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. So I trust this evening that you will recognize that there was a president. Can't call his name right at the moment, but I know you probably know it. But he made the statement, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Well... I came by tonight to let you know you don't even have to fear that because if you remember, and some of you may, uh, less than a few months back, maybe five or six, uh, entitled Fear Not, a message I brought. And you can always go back over to YouTube and bring up that message, Fear Not, and then you will understand that there's no reason. Jesus said, I'm going to go with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, you have to hold on to him and trust in him. And as long as you do that, you don't have anything to worry about. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. And he takes good care of you. And David, remember David, he said, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Now, when you break that down, David had a, uh, no need, had no want for any need. All that he needed, he had. I shall not want. Why? Because the shepherd provides. And if you haven't yet experienced it, then you have to get with the Lord. See, some of you out there faking it, but you haven't come to the Lord. And until you do, then you're not going to understand uh the magnitude of his blessings. And I'm not talking about something tomorrow. I'm saying here and now, because that's how the Lord works. So remember, you're always invited to be a participant of the gospel truth. So I'm encouraging you to join us again next week when the gospel truth will once again come your way, bringing to you spiritual songs and hymns and the power of the spoken word. Until then, it is, it is my prayer that God will continue to bless you and your family and to keep you all safe.